Thank you for recording, Mr. McCabe. I'd like to welcome everyone to our third and final webinar with NASA astronaut Robert Senker. Um, as housekeeping details, if everyone who is signed in online will look at the bottom of their screen, they'll see the microphone, which if they have clicked, it will be green and they will be heard as I'm being heard now. To the right of that is a camera, and if you click that, Mr. Senker can see you as if you're a guest in his office. That's very nice for him. He gets to talk to people then instead of a computer screen, which is much more responsive being a person. Yeah. So if you would please turn off your audio when you don't want to speak, but have your video on so Mr. Senker can get to invite you and host you in his office at his house, which is where he is right now. Mr. Senker, thank you so much for doing this for all the young people across the Terra Fairs who have worked so hard over these many months. And they did so well at their fairs last month. It really was a joy to see the splendid work the kids brought and to meet these really interesting young people. They couldn't be more fascinating souls. I can only imagine. <laughs> so I turn it over to you, sir, and I'm going to vanish. Okay, Ryan, we're up. Hiya, folks. What uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to guess, I don't know, were either of you in the two earlier web webinars? No, I was not. Okay. I was. Okay. These, I was these... before this. Say again? I was Say in again. the most previous one before this. Okay. Right. What I'm going to do today is I, one of the things that, that I struggle with when I do these kinds of things is whenever anyone sees or talks with an astronaut, typically what they really want to know is what's it like to be in space. And, and the first two uh, sessions, I was talking more about the science fair and, and, and how I got to be where I am and those kinds of things. So f for this wrap up session, I was going to try to answer the questions that that everybody really asked. What's it like? So I've got some some slides here to show you, and then uh, there will be time for questions afterwards based on the slides or based on anything else. I'm not shy as far as questions go. So if we could go to the next slide, Ryan. One of the things that I had discovered when I after I came back was the realization that when I was describing things or showing people pictures. They had no idea what I was doing, what I was showing them. And so I have a couple of drawings that basically show you what the inside of the space shuttle looked like. The, the left hand picture there is we're both down on the on downstairs, uh, what NASA calls the mid deck. And that wall of boxes that you see are modular lockers. That's where everything was packed. And if you go to the other side, you can see some modular lockers on the other ones. On the right hand side, we're looking back. You can see some seats there. Those seats are literally clipped to the floor. They're not a permanent part of the structure. When I show you some of the photos and you see the videos, you won't you will not see the chair because you don't need chairs in space. You're you're in zero G and you're floating around. And this drawing shows you the shuttle sitting on the ground. So imagine when you stand the shuttle up, those chairs are actually hanging from the wall. So because they're supporting your weight. Uh, during the vibration and the loads uh, of the launch, they actually weigh 90 pounds. So, and, and it gives you a little bit of, uh, of a test of your, of your faith in your discipline as an engineer. If you look carefully under the two seats, you can see an outline. That outline is a door. That door leads to actually below deck, which was a storage area. So remember what I said, the chairs are not permanently attached to the floor. On the right up, I'm hanging from the wall in a 90 pound chair 
and it's attached to a door with quick disconnects. And I had been told this, and I can remember thinking, please, God, let everything hold together while, while we're on the ride up, because it's not, none of it's permanent. And, but it all worked, and it, it worked many times. If you look uh, up on the right-hand side on the right, when you see waste collection system compartment, I don't get a lot of time to talk about this now, but one of the things that I normally get questions on, that's a mouthful of words for saying bathroom. That, that arrow is pointed at the bathroom door, and if you look at that door, you see it doesn't go to the ceiling and it doesn't go to the floor. The bathroom in the space shuttle was very tiny. When you were in there, your feet are hanging outside the door, so the door doesn't close behind you. It stays open for the duration of the flight, uh, but that's a whole nother story. If we go to the next slide, as I said, this was the mid-deck or downstairs. This is the flight deck. If you look in the left-hand view, you can see what looks like a ladder coming up through the uh, what's labeled the inner deck access hatch. And that ladder comes upstairs to the flight deck. And this is the cockpit. And you can see all the instruments that are associated with, with flying the vehicle. You can see the mission specialist seats are, are the back. And, and they, they operate essentially as flight engineers. And uh, the pilot and the co-pilot obviously are the ones who are actually flying the vehicle. And then on the right-hand side, you can see we're up on, still up on the flight deck, but now we're looking back. And, and what's the best part there is those aft viewing windows look back into the payload bay doors, back into the payload bay. What we did for fun was look out the windows. You, uh, you can see as a closed circuit TV monitor, when I've talked to young people, they say, can you watch TV in space? Well, technically you can. I mean, on space station, they have uh, they have DVDs, and and because people are living there, and if you're living there, you do need some entertainment. On a shuttle flight, uh, those closed circuit monitors were used for monitoring things outside the shuttle. We didn't have any time for formal entertainment on a on a six on a five day mission. We were supposed to be up for five days. We were scheduled to work 16 hours a day, which I'm sure you know most adults have at some point in their lives had to work. 14 to 16 hours a day to get get done whatever needs to be done. Okay, no more drawings. If we go to the next slide, those two show you now the photo. This is the the flight deck, or this is the the crew cabin up on top of the vehicle. When you see the pictures of those two rooms, obviously they're not very large, and and the shuttle is is a large vehicle. It's the size of an airliner, and and. People have asked, well, what happened to the rest of it? The, the part from the crew cabin back, which is, is actually chopped off in this picture, is the, uh, is the payload bay. And, and I, I liken it to the, to the back of the truck. I mean, this is where everything that you are going in the space to do typically gets packed. Uh, my satellite was stored back there. A lot of experiments were stored back there. But that crew cabin is, is where we actually live. That was the, the, the area, the, the volume that included those two drawings that I just showed you. And those two windows that you see out, the, the, the two black spots on the top, those are the good windows for looking out. And some, some very observant young lady once asked me, she said, but if you're already up in space, why would you look up? The shuttle isn't really flying. The shuttle's in orbit. And, and the difference is, 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 is very profound. You're not using the wings to stay up. You're using speed. And so the shuttle can fly in any orientation that, that suits the purposes. And it turns out for thermal reasons, they actually like to fly the shuttle upside down. So those two overhead windows were looking straight down at the ground. And imagine if you were in an airplane and instead of the floor, you had a glass floor and you could look down while you were flying over the world. Only we didn't have to look down. I spent all night one night and I was laying on the ceiling with a box of coffee next to me looking out those windows and we went around the world five times in that in that sleep period. So if I could go to the next slide. Whenever I show up at schools and you can probably see I'm wearing a, a blue flight jacket. This is a, the, essentially the uniform that we flew. Whenever I show up, I have a uniform that, that looks just like that. And, and the kids all want to know where my spacesuit is. I didn't have a spacesuit. The shuttle provided a shirt sleeve environment. And uh, after the Challenger accident, if you followed the program, uh, the subsequent flights, they had orange suits, they called them pumpkin suits. Those were not space suits. Those were called partial pressure suits. And those were there to provide them with a level of protection if anything had gone wrong. But for a normal flight, 
the uh, the shuttle, as I said, provided a shirt sleeve environment. You could probably, you could not probably, you could fly in the shuttle wearing whatever it is you're wearing right now, w without seeing you. I know you can wear whatever you're wearing because, as I said, it's a shirt sleeve environment. The one thing you need is one of those helmets, and you need one of those helmets because it it's a very special helmet. It does more than protect your head; it protects your hearing. If you look carefully around Charlie's face, you can see what looks like a black membrane. And if you see, there's an orange hose coming out of the back of it. When you put that helmet on and flip the visor down, that orange hose, you can see, goes to that little black box behind his seat. That's a personal emergency air pack, the PEEP. And it provides air to inflate seals in the helmet. And the reason it's, it's, it effectively seals your head in there to keep the sound out. One of the questions that always comes up is, what's it like on launch? And the answer is loud. We have broken satellites with noise. One of the things I do when I build satellites, and that's what I do for a living, is we expose them to noise so loud that I have broken metal with sound. And we're not talking about fragile crystal glass here. I'm talking about substantial hardware. So the sound is intense, and you have to protect your hearing. So you need a helmet like that. To, uh, to ride in the shuttle. If I could go to the next slide, please. If you look really carefully, you can see what looks like a banana taped to the wall. That's because it is a banana taped to the wall. One of the questions that often comes up is uh, the food. Everybody, most people have this notion that astronauts eat dried food cubes and paste out of toothpaste tubes and, and things that are generally disgusting. And, and the big surprise, particularly for adults, is you can eat anything in space you can here. I mean, a banana is a banana. The reason that banana is taped to the wall is in my house, the bananas sit on the counter. Uh, you can't set the banana on the counter in the space shuttle. It will simply float away. So we had these packed in a locker and we were down to the last one. And so rather than keep opening locker, we set it out and, and just taped it to the wall until somebody decided they want it. So you can eat or drink anything in space you can here. The only difference is how do you get it ready? A banana is simple. I mean, you, it's prepared, you just peel it. Other than the fact that you can let the peel float around the cabin, which you don't want to do, you put it in the trash. But eating a banana is not a big deal. If I could go to the next slide, you can see the trays. You can see that's the forward wall of lockers. You can see all the boxes there. And those silver things that you see right in the middle are trays. The boxes that you see the, uh, that are, are stuck, it, literally stuck into the trays, the tray, there's a slot in the tray. And it's just small enough that when you put the box in, it squeezes it. And so it holds it in place. And the box has everything you need in it for whatever it is you're eating. If you had a bowl of cereal this morning, you had space food. The only difference between the cereal you had this morning and what we had in space is how is it packaged. Down here, you pour the cereal into a bowl and then you add water. Well, you can't pour cereal into a bowl in space, but you take one of those boxes and NASA has it packed before we leave. And as I said, everything is prepared before we leave. Everything you need for a bowl of cereal is in that box. And it's a hard plastic box, but it's got a soft plastic cover on it. And if you look at them, you can see that the boxes have a corner that's different from the other ones. That corner accepts a fitting. When you put it in the galley, a needle gets punched into that. And that's how you add water. You literally inject the water into that. And after you've done that, you have a box of cereal exactly the same as the cereal you had this morning. The only difference is how do you get it ready? Now, the next question, which clearly comes up is, well, how do you eat a bowl of cereal in zero G. And, and the answer is exactly the same as you do here. If you think about it, if you had a bowl of cereal or a bowl of chili or a bowl of oatmeal and you picked it up and turned it over, it would spill out. But the bowl wouldn't be clean. Something's going to stick to the bowl. In space, it all sticks. Once you've added water to it, it simply sticks. You can take scissors, and everybody carries a pair of scissors in their in their uniform as part of the part of the gear, and you cut that soft plastic cover that I talked about, and you peel it back carefully, and the cereal sticks. And you put a spoon in it, and the cereal sticks in the bowl, in the in the box. The cereal sticks to the spoon, 
and you eat it exactly the same as you do here. So cooking is another problem. Uh, you can see the green packages there. Some of those are, are, are irradiated food. The food has to be stored. That's the trick. And I've been told, I'm not a camper, perhaps, perhaps some of you are, that the food is a lot like camping food because it has to be stored. It has to sit, it had to sit out in the Florida sun for three, four, five, ten days waiting for a launch. So you have to be able to store it without a refrigerator. And, and so most of it they've, I've told, been told is, is very similar to, to camp food. It's not bad. I, uh, I'm not going to say it's as good as home cooked food, but it's the same texture. It's the same taste. And, uh, the way I've carried, it's better than airline food, not to put down airline food, but because this is very consistent. It's packed by engineers and technicians down at the Johnson space center. So it's always done the same way. And when we, when we trained, we practiced day one, we ate the meals from day one. We practiced day two, we ate the meals from day two. And if you didn't like what was on the menu, then you simply change the menu and say, I don't want that. Give me something else. Uh, for instance, they had three different kinds of scrambled eggs. They had uh, just regular scrambled eggs. They had seasoned scrambled eggs and they had Mexican scrambled eggs with jalapeno peppers in them. And I liked the seasoned scrambled eggs. So every place there were scrambled eggs on the menu, I took them off and I put seasoned scrambled eggs. So the food is not bad. If I, if, and one other thing, if you look at the black patches there, the magnetics, they're mag magnetic strips. The silverware just sticks to the spoon, it sticks to the plate while you're eating. And nobody has put their silverware up on there yet. But, and if you look really carefully in the middle of the right hand column, you see what looks like a little can. I often get asked by the kids if I like the astronaut freeze dried ice cream. Not particularly. I'm a bigger fan of fruit cocktail. That is a can of fruit cocktail. And when you open the can of fruit cocktail, the fruit cocktail does not rise up out of the can. It sticks. There's syrup in there and the syrup holds it in the can. And you'll see in, in the section of the video, uh, I'm, I'm eating a can of fruit cocktail and, and unfortunately I didn't quite do a good enough job of it, but you'll see in the video what comes up. I can go to the next slide. You can also have junk food. You can see the pastry. Those are just like the pastries you get out of the vending machine. And, and the big advantage of, of eating them in space is you know how if you eat one of these pastries down here, when you hold it, your fingers, your fingers get sticky from the glaze. You don't have to touch them. You can see in my, my left hand that I'm, I'm holding, I've, I've taken the wrapper and I just squeezed it out of the wrapper. So I've got the wrapper in my hand. I never have to touch it. I can literally eat it out of space, out of the, out of the air, and then put the wrapper in the trash. So the food, as I said, is not bad. If I go to the next slide. Okay. Take one of those boxes and you can see the box that Franklin is holding. This is one of the guys on my crew. And there's a, you put a straw in where you injected the water and you can see there's a clip on the straw so that this, the orange juice doesn't spill out and you normally would undo the clip and then drink it out of the, out of the box. But here, Franklin, rather than drink it, go ahead, let's turn the video on and see what happens. Uh, nothing. Oh, we had this working. Oh, there we are. He's going to squeeze it without drinking it. And this is the, uh, the proverbial water ball. And you can see the water just sort of floats around the cabin. And he does manage to get hold of the water. We did play with our food. I said we didn't have any formal entertainment. Uh, meal time was a time when you could do things like this and just relax for a little bit while you were, you were scheduled to be doing something. And, and that was obviously eating. And if we go to the next slide or the next, the next video, you'll see that can that's in my hand and I'm eating fruit cocktail, but I let the, uh, the spoon get away from me. There we go. And so the spoon, if you're looking really carefully, got away. So I had to just sort of chase it across the cabin, but that's okay because it goes up, down, anywhere. And finally, I have one more view inside the cabin. You can see the wall of lockers on the right-hand side. And you can see the bathroom door behind me there. 
And I had this fascination with turning sideways. That that box that I'm holding was actually one of my experiments, but I had just taken that off, and they, they wanted a video shot. And so I, uh, I had this fascination with turning sideways. I have no idea why. I used to try to dive in college, so I've done normal tumbling. But ha having the freedom to turn that way in zero G just struck me as being really entertaining. And finally, and this is, uh, this is for you folks, if we go to the, the last slide, this is something that I want to emphasize to the young people. It doesn't always work. I, I worry a lot in the current environment. We need to have a balance between being success oriented, which is a good thing, and recognizing that we're not going to get it right every time. This was my first radio control airplane before and after. And, and I think you can figure out from the after that the flight did not go well. Uh, but that was the beginning. This, this was how I wound up getting into, uh, into what I'm doing. And uh, I've had better, better fortune in my work than I did with this airplane. Uh, but that's primarily because I'm, when I built that airplane, it was just my brother and I. Uh, now there's a, there's a whole army of people, and this is this is part of the thing of working in groups that that's really important. When you have an army of people, you have to be able to listen to to the other people and explain to the other people. One of the things that I've talked about is that the STEM subjects are very important, and 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 equally important though are communication skills. You need to be able to explain to people your problems when you ask questions in the STEM subjects, when you're, when you're trying to figure things out. You need to be able to verbalize your questions. I don't understand this because. And, and those communication skills are important. And, and that's one of the reasons, as I said, my career has been much more successful than, uh, than that first radio control airplane. So that is all I have in terms of presentation. Be, I thought we were going to have more people, so I'm not sure. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, so you said you were walking like 16 hours a day. It's like what kind of things are you walking on? I had my communication satellite was actually deployed on flight day one. That was the first thing that we popped out because that was the most important part of the mission. We had an infrared camera that we were using to take pictures of thermal subjects on the earth, thermal pollution, volcanoes, uh, ships at sea, things that, that, that you couldn't see. The camera that we had developed, they'll come out and take pictures of your house now with an, with an infrared camera. And it, it can typically see about one degree C. The camera that RCA had developed, and I worked for RCA when I flew, could see a tenth of a degree C. And so the, the question was, so what? You know, what can you do with that? Uh, and so we were looking down to see, can you see, can you see the thermal uh, signature of a ship? Can you see uh, a nuclear, an energy plant that's, that's using cooling power, using cooling water? Can you see the water coming out warmer? Can you track those kinds of things from in orbit? So those were my primary experiments. Mr. Sanker, I've been very curious. When you were accepted into the program that you could become a mission specialist, what was it like for your family? What was their reaction? Okay, first remember I was a payload specialist, not a mission specialist. I'm sorry, you're right, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, what that means, uh, Liam and, and Hillary, is payload specialists flew associated with a particular payload. In this case, I worked for RCA and it was that satellite that, that I was responsible for. I actually had a, a prenup with my wife. When I asked her to marry me, uh, because she was married, I was asking her to marry an engineer. She, she had no idea that this nutcase was going to try and sit on four million pounds of explosives so they could light it. I told her, I said, uh, I said, are you okay with that? And, and she thought about it for a while and she said, can I think about that? 
And she called me the next day and said, yeah, we can, we'll go for that. Now, since then, she has told me that that night she thought about it and said, what are the chances really that this guy is ever going to get a chance to do this? <laughs> so I had applied twice to be career before I flew and had gotten turned down with thousands of other people. And, but it was no secret at RCA where I worked that I wanted to do this. I had gone as high up the the management chain as I could for recommendations. So everybody knew that I wanted to do this. And when the uh, when the opportunity came up for RCA to send one of their engineers, that was one of the things that, okay, we know that his family, that everybody is lined up, that he's in, kept, I kept myself in good physical condition. Uh, and and I, was, I was ready to do that. But when I went home that day and, and told her that, uh, that I was going to do this, I didn't even have to tell her. She just looked at me and she said, you're going to fly, aren't you? And my kids were in first and second grade at the time. My boys were. My daughter was, wasn't even a year old. And uh, I told the boys, I says, daddy's going to fly in space. This is the exact reaction. That's nice. Can we go play football? <laughs> oh, my heavens. God's honest truth. Their principal at their school contacted me we were talking to their principal and she said uh she said i'm a little worried about the boys she says because they don't seem to to understand what a big deal this is and i told her i said think about where they're coming from but first and second grade they don't know they didn't the first implication the first hint they got that this was a big deal was when the press release hit and the level of the TV stations got in touch with me and they had a press conference. And so I come home and I'm enough of an egotist that I'm watching myself on TV. And my son, the younger son, is, is lay, sitting on the floor and he watches on TV and he looks up at me and he watches on TV and you can see the wheels turning. It's like, okay, my dad is not normally on television. There must be something weird <laughs> on here he and i think that was the first connection he made that this was something extremely special wow thank you how do you sleep like do you like strap yourself in and like how does that work the the preferred method in space station they actually have a little cubby that you can close yourself into on the shuttle they had sleep restraints and and for lack of a better word, it's like a sleeping bag. Only when people think sleeping bag, they think of something that's padded. And there's no padding because you're not sitting on anything. And you tie yourself to the wall. You tie yourself to the wall or the ceiling or the floor, wherever it's convenient, and you fall asleep. Some people do have a problem sleeping because on flight day one, I had a problem sleeping because I had a serious case of space adaptation. Space adaptation is sometimes referred to as space sickness. Uh, it is not sickness, it is getting used to zero gravity. And one of the symptoms is sensory deprivation. You're not touching anything. While you're sitting there right now, you feel something on your bottom. When you stand up, you'll feel something on the bottom of your feet. You go into space, you're not touching anything. You can feel your clothes sort of loosely around you, but it's not the same. And so on flight day one, I actually stuck myself in a corner so I could feel something along my back while I was sleeping. But once I was adapted to weightlessness, I literally took the Velcro strips on my uniform and hung myself on the wall one night to fall asleep. And that worked just fine. Uh, how was how was like re-entry? Like I know the the different thing, different methods are used. Like how did you re-enter the uh... re-entry on the shuttle was always very similar. I mean the the basic maneuver was the same. As I said earlier, the shuttle isn't flying. It's 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 in orbit, which means it's going. The magic number is orbital velocity. It's about twenty five thousand feet per second, and you're you're essentially going so fast this way that you're falling around the round Earth. So you're just going around and around and around. So to come home, all you have to do is slow yourself down just a little bit. And what that means is you don't fall, 
but instead of falling around the earth, you start to dip just a little bit into the atmosphere. And as you start to dip into the atmosphere, you slow down more from the from what little air drag there is. And when you slow down more, you fall more. You fall more, the air is deeper, blah, 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 blah. So the whole process takes about 45 minutes. You go a half a rev. If I wanted to land down here, I slow myself down up here, and it'll take me about a half a rev to go halfway around the world. And it's all computed on the shuttles onboard computer systems. And one of the things that goes on and uh, went on in the shuttle, and they used to do it on space station, is you, you, you maintain a continuous track of where is my next opportunity to land. Because obviously you can't just decide I'm going home now. You, you're flying and you say, okay, the next opportunity I'm going to be to land is there's a runway over here. So my next opportunity to land is when I get to here. And if I'm over a runway right now, I'm saying, okay, my next opportunity to land is when I've gone halfway around, because then I'll slow down on here and fall halfway around the world to get here. And so those are the kinds of things you have to plan ahead for. But the actual re-entry, uh, the slowing yourself down is so so slight. It's only 200 feet per second out of 25,000. You hardly know you've done it. You have to be strapped into your seat. You have to be prepared to come home. Uh, but you, it's very, it's just barely a nudge. You can hardly feel it. And uh, it's it's somewhat exciting because there's turbulence in the jet stream. And after six days in space, we hit some turbulence at about 300,000 feet that gets your attention really good. But uh, no, the reentry was, you've got two of the best pilots in the country. And by definition, they won't let them land unless the conditions are as, as good as they can be. So when the mains touched down, I hardly felt it. Now, on the shuttle program, when the mains touched down, but once the mains touched down, they wanted the front, so they plant the front one. I mean, it, it drops. You felt that one because you're sitting up here anyway. Uh, but other than that, no, the reentry was uh, was was not a problem. I was nervous during reentry because of the the heating. You look out the window and it's it's like you're inside a light bulb. But uh, that's psychological. It's not physical. So would you like compare it to like a plane landing? Is yeah. it like that kind of ease? Yeah. 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 Cool. Mr. Sanker, we're not far apart in age. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching the first launch. I remember watching Sputnik go over. Um, the the first time we had someone land and there was that silent time when you didn't know if they'd made it into the ocean and then they had to go find the capsule. When mm -hmm. you look at that's where it started in your lifetime and you got to fly in the shuttle yourself and now we have people living in the iss a year at a time what what's your response to all of that change but all of those dreams i think it's inevitable you know i'm i'm not a huge fan of of the move to go to Mars today. I think there is, there's, Mars is not going anywhere. I, I, I don't believe we're ready to, I believe we should go to Mars. I believe absolutely we will go to Mars. Uh, Liam, how old are you? I'm 15. Okay. You're a good candidate to be the first person on Mars. Okay. It's not going to be somebody my age. It will be somebody your age. Because I, when I flew, I was 37. Okay, and if you're 15, that puts you 20 years to get to that age. I, I think it's going to take us that long, not because of the the technology. I mean, the Elon Musks of the world and NASA could build a space spacecraft tomorrow that would take us to Mars if we could find somebody to pay for it. But psychologically, I've talked to people who have been to the moon. And when you hear them talk about looking back and seeing this little blue marble with everything and everyone they ever knew, 
they were moved by that. Psychologically, they were affected by that. When we leave for Mars, after about a week, there's not going to be a blue marble. There will be nothing but stars. When they were on the moon, they were never more than, as I said, when we do in space station, we're always, we're always looking for when can we come home? When can we come home? When can we come home? On the moon, three days, two to three days, we can come home. We can come home. We leave for Mars. There's no coming home. You have committed to spending the next three years in this environment. There is no doubt in my mind we can do that. There is no doubt in my mind that we will. Uh, I have great doubts as whether we're ready to do it now. I don't know how we pick a crew. And these are the kinds of things that your generation is going to have to figure out. Uh, you know, we, we, we put people on the Arctic. We put them in these habitats to isolate them. And that's all good. Those are necessary things. But they're still here. They know they're here. They know that help is on the other side of that wall. When you leave for Mars, it's all gone. And as I said, there's no doubt in my mind we can. There's no doubt in my mind we will. But I think we have more work to do in that area. So it's, it's the life sciences, if you will, that I think need need work in terms of catching them. I mean, that's why I'm a big fan of going back to the moon first. Okay, so let's, let's get and let's, let's let people live up there and see how they react. They really do react because over and above, I was in Scotland and I had uh, one of the students asked me, and I've never gotten this question before. You've probably heard about the bone decalcification. Your, your bones leach calcium in space and they're working on that. They think they understand that. The latest concern is the interocular pressure in the eye. And some of the astronauts are now coming back and their vision has been impacted. And there are concerns about that. Okay, and those are measurable, observable things. And one of the kids asked me, does it change your brain? Good question. I don't know. And we, we certainly can't, you know, roll the dice and see if it does. We need to let people live and work in zero G and find out does the does the does the chemistry change? Well, we know the chemistry changes. How does the chemistry change? That we don't know. And so there are a lot of questions like that which still remain to be answered. And, and as I said, we can and we will, but there's no rush. Mars is not going anywhere. And so, as I said, your age, I, I think, is about right. Give us 20 years, and I think we can sort through it. I, I personally believe in going to Mars. Like, maybe not personally, but I believe we should go to Mars as a society, and I believe there's importance in that. But I'm going to play devil's advocate because I want to know what, I want to know what you was going to say because a lot of people think it's not really important. It's expensive. It's time-consuming. It's very draining. The world has a lot of pushing issues right now. What would you say to someone who says it may not be like as important to go to Mars or what is the purpose of going to a, a dead planet? It is our nature to explore. I mean, what was the purpose for Columbus when he sailed across the ocean? Okay, and you don't have to go to Columbus. You have a younger brothers or sisters? No. No, okay. Watch, watch a three-year-old or a four-year-old in a mall, and what are they doing? They're going off exploring. Okay, what's, go into a mall, and they're, they're running into another, because they want to find out what's there. They're out in the backyard climbing a tree because they want to get higher. What can I see from up there? It is in our genes to explore. So what will we find there? I don't know. But uh, the... The transistor, which changed everything we know, the invention of the transistor, was not invented by a guy trying to invent a transistor. The guy was trying to understand why do metals conduct electricity. It was pure science. Why does this happen? He had no goal in mind. And, and in trying to figure that out, 
he discovered this material. He found this one material in, in trying to figure out what the differences were. It, sometimes it conducted electricity and sometimes it didn't. It's a semiconductor. Oh, I can make a device out of this. And it's changed us. Some people might argue for better or worse, but it has changed yeah. us profoundly. I mean, this conversation, this. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to claim to know what we're going to find on Mars, but we will do things that we can't do here. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a great answer. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's never it's never been a bad thing when we've gone exploring, like no. as far as like other planets. No, nothing a, bad happens. We went to the moon. And, and, yeah. and, it, and it needs to be a compromise. Uh, you know, the combination of, you know, people say, well, let's do it with robots. Well, they don't have a robot or a computer yet. If you stop and think, I mean, we're looking at this video and the video is sort of blah, 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 blah. And I've got a good machine here. My computer is a good machine. Okay. I don't know what you have, but there isn't a computer yet conceived or even dreamt of that can process the information like your mind can. If you stop and think about it, I mean, the, the, they talk about facial recognition software, and yet you can go out in the street, look 50 or 100 feet away and see a friend at a distance, at a, at a glance, and say, oh, there he is. You just process that information. So it needs to be a combination of men and machines. You, there are people who criticize manned spaceflight are absolutely right that robots can do a lot. But as I said, there isn't a machine yet that, that will ever come close to the uh, to the ability of the human mind. When I was growing up, um, we had ducks, we had different animals that we raised, and my sister uh, salvaged birds that had fallen out of nests. And if you didn't let them fly at the moment they were ready to fly, mm. they ended up not flying and dying. Yeah. And, and there's a piece of me that feels like all the science fiction I've been reading since I was 12 years old and all of the, the things that have happened that we've seen happen in the space program and in genetics and um, our knowledge of prehistory, all of this, it's like we're moving in a direction. And if we stop, I wonder if we'll be crushed against the weight of our momentum. I don't, the, crushed against, against what is waiting for us. And if we don't climb it, we lose our moment. I there, are always things, there are always things to learn. There are always things to learn. We're never going to have all the answers. The more the more we learn, the more questions we have. It's kind of like science fair. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's why science fair is such a good prep. Because that's absolutely true. I have given a lot of thought to when I retire, teaching a lab course where I would not allow the students to attend. Just give them a handful of data and say, here, explain this. Or the compromise is, is split a class in half, okay, and say, okay, you guys do experiment A, you guys do experiment B, and write down all the stuff you did. And as you walk out of the classroom, say, okay, you give them your information, what you wrote, you give them yours. Now go off and write the report and figure out what, what happened over there. Because we don't do it. This is why I'm so big on communication skills. Because no matter how hard we try, the English language is not particularly precise and explaining things to people and listening to people is a very difficult task. And, and, and it's, it's part of the whole process, as I say, of STEM and, and trying to understand all of these things. Thank you. I'm going to really fall out with this one. What do, you, what do you think about like colony ships and like the idea of like generation ships and sending people off to colonize a planet thousands or millions of light years away? I, 
think eventually it'll happen. Uh, it, it's going to take the warp drive, the the fundamental <laughs> physics. Uh, just just because you know we think of it as science fiction. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, what I did was science fiction. So, yeah. you know, I can't imagine it. I can't conjure it up. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. And so, yeah, I believe that eventually it will. Just because we can't, can't imagine it. About the only thing I think is impossible is time travel. Okay. Other, other than that, I'm, I'm good for, I'm, I'm go for almost anything. I don't believe, because to me, there's a fundamental problem of, okay, if I, because if I can go back in time, I can change something. And now everything that's happened now is different. Now that just makes my head hurt. I, 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 yeah. So, but as far as I'm concerned, everything else is fair game. Colonies, uh, you know, living on Mars, going to the stars. Yeah. I, I believe eventually it'll happen. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, but, but I shouldn't even say that it's, it's not impossible. You know, we just lost, uh, uh, the physicist, the brilliant physicist who just died. Stephen Hawking, uh, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Yes. I mean, obviously the man was brilliant, uh, but there are other equally brilliant people and, uh, you know, one of them will come up with something that, that we can't conjure up and so you know if it happened tomorrow maybe they could build one of the guys that i flew with franklin chang diaz has patented or has formed a company and he is working on a new propulsion system that is nowhere near a warp drive but it's it's a factor of 10 better than anything else that we have now and, and i am confident in saying that when people go to mars if, if you go to mars you'll be using something called VASMIR, V-A-S-M-I-R, Variable Specific Impulse Rocket Engine. Uh, and it's his, it's his invention. And uh, so, you know, there are things like that going on in the world. I think we have used enough of your evening sir that we should let you have the rest to yourself i'm really grateful not only for tonight but for the other two sessions you've been so generous and please tell your wife barbara how glad we are <laughs> that when we put this on the table and talked the three of us found that this was something you wanted to do yeah um and the fact that Mr. McCabe and Finger Lakes Community College are able to record it so we can upload it to the blog is a wonderful thing. And everyone who listens to this can hear that there is Ask an Astronaut <laughs> on the blog. And if someone has a question, you will up, upload in a response to it to Tara so they can post it. I think that long-term relationship you want with all the middle school and high school kids in all of our 22 counties i think that's astounding and far and above any call of duty that someone would have it's truly generous and i thank you no problem liam, thank you what, what, are, what are your plans for school liam i don't know just yet i'm only a freshman but I, I love science, I love math, I love engineering, something with that. Sounds good. Go for it. Whatever you pick. People have asked me what they should study. I said something that you love. That works. So I wish you good night. I thank Mr. McCabe for all of his work in running these three webinars for us online. I thank you for the generous a uh, gift from Finger Lakes Community College of the time of Mr. McCabe and access to their technology so we could have this Terra Science Fair's room at Finger Lakes. Um, 
all of these coming together to make this possible. We've really been blessed. Yep. So have a good evening. And this finishes out our webinars for the 2018 Science Fair cycle. All right. I'm going to sign off. Liam, it's been good talking with you. Good luck in school. You too. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.